Okay, what's up everybody? Goldie here, <clears throat> and happy Monday. Hope we all had a, a good weekend. Um, some quick housekeeping notes. Uh, probably try to, for the most part, minimize um, the video content on the weekends. Um, try to get something out for you guys uh, a lot of the time on Saturdays, but uh, no promises there. And Sundays for me are generally, certainly with the early slates, um, you know, locking at uh, at one Eastern, um, you know, early compared to the rest of the season. Uh, a little more difficult for me to to get uh, you know some video content out. So uh, that said, we'll still have projections um, every day, and yeah, you know, that that should be up. Um, we have fixed the technical issues as far as um, my uploads, my personal projections uh, to number one, the, the DFS site. Those are available for premium subs under the Goldie DK tab. Um, right now, just for the main slates, but uh, we also hope to have later on in the season, um, hopefully sooner than, than later, the secondary slates. Um, now, today, for example, we do have a couple of smaller slates, an early slate, and then we got some, uh, we got a turbo um, starting at about, what, 640 Eastern, I believe. Um, so we're not going to have, I won't have any projections up for, for these couple of games just yet, but like I said, we're working on those in the background. Um, so keep an eye out for, uh, for updates regarding that. Um, we also have the projections pushed to Saversim now, so those with the uh, Saversim add-on with us, uh, you should have availability. Those should populate into your projection model under the column with the projections and the ownership under um, Goldie DK and Goldie DK own or something like that, uh, or perhaps just Goldie projection and, and goalie ownership um so keep an eye out for those and feel free to uh, use those and or sheets projections for some combination of the two uh as you are building teams so uh that said let's um let's get into today big 11 gamer um on on a monday here so we're getting to the back end of some of these rotations and as we saw yesterday there was a lot of garbage really on the mound and you kind of didn't really have a choice but to eat the 50 and 60% ownership that we saw on Jeff Springs against Detroit. Um, clearly, it, I mean, it worked, right? Like, generally, we don't want to be eating that much uh, that much ownership on any single player, including a pitcher. Um, he was very clearly mispriced at 7,800, but really still kind of difficult to stomach uh, on a full 11 game slate when you've got 22 different pitchers to choose from. But um, that was kind of the dynamic yesterday and that he was really the only good arm that you could feel pretty confident in. And we're seeing a little bit more of that sort of spill over to today's slate. Now we do still have some aces up here, like a, a Nestor. Um, yeah, Drew Rasmussen's got really good stuff. Charlie Morton, of course, uh, leader in the um, in the Atlanta rotation over here. Uh, George Kirby down here for the Mariners as well. Um, but we also have some back end guys like a James Caprillion, a Ryan Feltner, um, Zach Plezak, kind of a middle rotation guy. Josie Barrios got blasted last season, uh, potentially attackable here. But we also have John Gray leading the Texas rotation and he had, well, not leading anymore um, with the Grom down there, but you know, he had, he kind of anchored the rotation for them last season and had a really good year. So uh, a good mixture here of guys, um, you know, on the mound. And I think we can probably uncover some, uh, some exploitable spots. So that said, let's get into it. First of all, we do have the projections uploaded for today. Um, they are available on the site and 
early, early, early ownership stuff here. So, uh, of course, you know, we'll have uh, updates pushed uh, throughout the day. So just continue to check in. Um, I, I do my best to, to update several different times as, as news and lineups come out or whatever. Um, so these numbers are, once again, very noisy. And they will flesh out as we get closer to first pitch t this evening. So let's uh, let's just get into the games and stop the yapping here, huh? Um, Philly and the Yankees um, in Yankee Stadium. Philly off to a pretty cold start so far. 0-3. Uh, they got Taiwan Walker on the mound at 8,700. Not really sure I want to be touching him against the Yankees today. Uh, not enough whiff stuff, and that's really how, when we do attack the Yankees, how we're going to want to approach them. Um, you're going to need to throw it by them. Judge will strike out, uh, Stanton strikes out, Donaldson strikes out, um, all of these. You know, there's some attackability in here. Now, guys like yeah, Glaber strikes out a little bit. Um, Anthony Rizzo won't so much, but uh, down here at the bottom of the lineup, there's going to be some gettable and attackable pieces uh, a lot of the time as well. Now, these are lineups from yesterday, so don't put too much stock into that. But, um, you know, that said, that's how we want to attack the Yankees in general. And Taiwan Walker, just a 20% strikeout rate. Good suppression m numbers here. 350 ERA with the 388 XFIP. Uh, I do have... Um, numbers loaded in here that's why we see a zero x era i do have numbers loaded in here from both of uh the 2022 season and the 2023 season as we get into it here so that's really why that's not going to display for us but um we can we can gauge pretty well uh between the xfip and the era buck 20 whip because he doesn't really walk people he's always had pretty good control going back to his early days in arizona and it's because he throws strike one. Now, he's got some good chase in him with 30% O-swing, um, but a pretty mediocre, just 10% swinging strike right now. On today's slate, that's actually pretty average, slightly above average, um, I should say. But it does lead overall to about a 26.5% CSW with a low swinging strike rate, or a call strike rate, excuse me. So that's really how we want to attack the Yankees. It's, with, it's guys that can... Um, really paint and and throw it by them and induce swing and miss and taiwan walker really unfortunately um with the full five and even six pitches that he's throwing uh none of them are all that excellent outside of the splitter um but unfortunately you can't really throw a split 65 percent of the time to induce that kind of swing and miss so um numbers outside of that you know really really strong against taiwan so not terribly attackable uh, but will pitch to a bit more contact pushing 79 80 percent here so um, against any arms like that you can certainly play the yankees you're just going to run into pricing issues as you will always because you're going to want to play judge and against guys that will not throw it by stanton uh, you're going to want to play him as well so those two are going to make it difficult glaber here at 47 uh, is pretty stiff also um so probably not my favorite stack of the day to get to the Yankees. And initially we are seeing some pretty low ownership on these guys uh, overall. So um, probably staying off personally for the Yankees, but you can definitely mix in um, some some of the power bats and attack a high contact rate for Taiwan Walker. Nestor on the other side, 9,700. Um, a bit of a an elevated projection here at... Uh, as a median, pushing 19 points against Philly, um, seems a, a bit aggressive out of the gate here. And at 30% ownership, uh, also probably pretty aggressive. Now, Philly is average in the strikeout department. And that, this was split adjusted against left-handers last year. It, it does include um, the first couple of games of this season as well. But they did create a 115 clip and hit for a decent bit of power. Buck 65 ISO with the 335 Woba. That's a pretty good number. So uh, a little worrisome in that regard, given the slightly elevated projection and the ownership figure for Nestor. Now, he's one of the few aces on the mound that's actually got really good swinging strike stuff. Excellent CSW percentage, pushing 20 to 28, 30% nearly, and a 26.5% K rate. Of course, the suppression at 244 ERA with 363 XFIP, 
perhaps a bit of regression coming in that department, but he doesn't walk anybody, and that's why the whip is so low at 092. Stays off the barrel, even though he is a fly ball pitcher, and that's really what we want to see, especially what for a lefty um, pitching at a high school field at, at Yankee Stadium here. So there's no hard contact really to speak of, and the suppression numbers um, and in the power department are fantastic against both sides of the plate. Buck 10 average, 202 average to lefties and righties, respectively, 161, 259 Wobas, and 049 and 137 ISOs to each side as well. So it uh, doesn't translate into power numbers, and that's really what we do like to see uh, in general for a starting pitcher. Good pitch mix. Uh, really uh, relies on the four-seamer cutter slider mix, which once again... Uh, tends him toward a, a fly ball lean. Um, and it's always concerning when we're playing a fly ball pitcher at Yankee Stadium. So um, given the the construction of the Phillies lineup this season and Nestor being a fly baller, um, despite the fact that he, he does have whiffs, elevated ownership really kind of takes me off of this a little bit. Not my favorite, but if you land on him, you can definitely play him. He's certainly one of the better arms of the day. Moving on, uh, Tampa and Washington. Um, uh, I guess let's go back really quick. Uh, Philly, if you want to take some pieces against some of that ownership, uh, I think that's that's fine. You're going to pay for it, of course. Uh, Nick Castellanos here, 4200 This is a pretty decent price. Alec Bohm, 3600 I like this as well. Uh, Josh Harrison doesn't really strike out. Kind of a pest. If he, He's very cheap at 2100 if you need a, um, a cheap filler, multi-position eligibility at second base and the outfield. So... Something to consider if you want to get off some of the nester. Um, now on to Tampa Bay and, and Washington. Drew Rasmussen, 8,100. like this a lot, as a matter of fact. Lower projection. I think this is probably in aggregate um, as a median projection, maybe a little bit low. As of right now, about 9 10% ownership that we're seeing on him. Slightly depressed overall strikeout rate. Uh, but this really increased quite a bit toward the end of last season when he really, really got the slider going. Um, he had a couple of starts there where he was uh, he was just a fantastic play where we were getting him uh, pretty cheap over on DK, and we're right about in that same range. 8,000, I think there's pretty good value on him. Really good, I mean, sub-3 three sub three ERA and doesn't walk anybody. Throws strike one, stays off the barrel. So that's really what we want to target against a really hapless Washington Nationals team. Now, I know they kind of got a little bit to Jordan Schuster yesterday, but that's because he walked the entire country. So uh, Rasmussen's not going to do that. And when he's got his slider-cutter combo going, um, a really good fastball mix here between the four-seamer and the cutter. And when he can, he's really got the slider biting, um, it makes him virtually unhittable. So uh, I think this is some decent value here at 8,100 for Rasmussen. Really nothing to speak of in the way of susceptibility to either side of the plate. Um, good power numbers, good strikeout numbers, uh, respectable strikeout numbers. Admittedly, uh, slightly below league average, but Washington um, really isn't going to bring a whole hell of a lot to the batter's box this season in terms of... Um, intimidation, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, Jamer's going to strike out a crap load. Dom's going to strike out a lot, uh, et cetera, et cetera, on down the list. So definitely an attackable lineup over here. Really the only guy that you're going to be scared of all season is Joey Manessas, and you want him more against uh, lefties. So Drew Rasmussen, I think this is a very playable spot here today. Market probably a little bit low on him. Trevor Williams on the other side, decent, um, you know, decent fastball stuff here, but and he used to have an excellent changeup. Uh, last couple of seasons, the breaking and the off-speed stuff has really kind of fallen off a cliff. Um, and it really helped suppress a lot of the power to left the left side of the plate uh, did his changeup. But any more, I mean, as of last season, 320 average allowed, 376 Woba, huge number, with a full 195 ISO to lefties and a 9% strikeout rate. So big, big problems here that he can't get lefties out anymore. And in aggregate, a 22.5% strikeout rate. And as you can see, there's a huge, huge delta here in a large sample. Over 89 and two-thirds last year. Did come out of the bullpen a little bit, but... Um, we should expect these numbers to, to drop, you know, uh, 
I guess flatten out is a better way to say it. Um, a 32% strikeout rate for a bullpen arm coming out and facing mostly same-handed hitters is kind of expected. Um, as that flattens out in, in terms of the number or number of lefties that he will see on average, this will drop and normalize a little bit, but that doesn't mean the strikeout rate to lefties is going to come up. It's just that the strikeout rate to righties is likely to come down. So uh, how we want to attack Trevor Williams is with the lefties. Um, you know, not a, a terribly alarming barrel rate or anything, and, and hard contact is, is still perfectly fine. Sub 30% rates there uh, in the StatCast realm. Um, but the extra base hits and, and homers are a, a little bit of uh, an issue for Washington, and the park can give it up here a little bit. So I think getting to some of the lefties over here for Tampa – in particular, Wander Franco, he's had a really good start to the season. Still 4700 that's a, definitely a playable price. Brandon Lau, 3700 also very playable at uh, second base here. I'm going to play some Josh Lowe in the outfield. Cheaper to make it a little bit more attainable. Randy hits righties okay, and he's at 5100 You can mix him in also. If you want to play a Luke Rayleigh, uh, if he's in the three-hole or something, this is a fantastic spot. Uh, a really, really good value play. Also, you know, certainly popping in the point per dollar metric so far. Um, relatively low ownership on the raise so far. So I think you can get to a, a decent little three-man here if you'd like. Uh, okay. Um, Pittsburgh and Boston. I think we're going to be able to attack some hitters here as well. Um, Oviedo on the mound for the Pirates. 6,800. I don't really think we want to attack him. Um, he's got trouble throwing strike one and getting ahead of hitters, which leads to an elevated walk rate. So uh, pitching to a, a fine contact rate, about 77%, so no, nothing terrible right there. Um, and he stays off the barrel at just a 140 ground ball to fly ball ratio. So a fine mix, relies heavily on the slider here with a pretty mediocre four-seamer, um, but decent breaking stuff. So that does when he can't locate the four-seamer, allow him to get out of some problems um, that he may cause for himself. But overall, just a 22.5% strikeout rate, very low to left to the left side. So that's how we'd probably want to go after him. Also came out of the bullpen a good bit last season, so these numbers will most likely normalize if he's going to be in the rotation. But um, you know, really, really good against righties. 248 average allowed, slightly elevated, but you know nothing terrible. 315 woven, a buck 55 ISO. These are fine numbers, but a 25 and a half percent strikeout rate. A, a good bit of swing and miss, and that's because of the, you know, plus value on the slider and the plus value on the curveball. Um, two same-handed hitters. So how we want to attack him? Just because he doesn't throw a change up all that often, hasn't given up power. A whole hell of a lot, but again, that's a bit noisy and a shorter sample because he was coming out of the bullpen and mostly facing right-handed hitters last season. So um, expect this to normalize, and there's the worrisome walk rate when he can't locate the four-seamer and doesn't have an off-speed pitch uh, like a good changeup. He's forced to rely on a slider, which will break down and in to left-handers, and that's generally a pretty troublesome scenario that you don't want to get into with uh, with a slider. So um, a little bit of susceptibility here, and that means you can get to uh, some Rafi Devers for sure. Uh, he's expensive, 5,900, but once again, one of the better hitters in the league. Um, really only seeing about 15% ownership on him right now. Not too bad, but a decent value play so far. Um, we did see Masataka Yoshida get off the schneid a little bit and and get into a ball yesterday. So hopefully he's getting a little bit more comfortable with um, big league pitching. But from the right side, still probably don't want to target him. I think um, some one-offs like a, an Alex Verdugo, he'll probably be leading off again uh, at 4,300. I think this is an okay play today. Maybe a little two-man stack with the Devers you can you can get to as well. Uh, not too many super expensive arms, so I think you can pay for a little bit of hitting today if you need to. Uh, on the other side, Cutter Crawford, I think we can attack him as well. Um, a really marginal arsenal. He's, he's got about five pitches that he mixes in, and really none of them are all that all that outstanding, to be quite honest. Um, throws strike one, but has a little bit of trouble throwing strikes uh, two and three, I suppose, um, stays really kind of on the barrel and gives up a, a 
you know, quite alarming hard hit rate to left-handed hitters. Uh, did come out of the bullpen last year, but um, he was getting tattooed by lefties. 275 average, 407 Woba, and a 325 ISO. Does have some swing and miss against them, but he's also walking them at an 11.5% clip. 45% hard contact rate. That is way, way, way too high. Full two pro- excuse me, 2.6 homers per nine with no soft, soft contact induced. So um, that means from the Pirates, it's our good friend O'Neill Cruz and um, I suppose Brian Reynolds as well at the top of the list. You can get to a Jimon Choi. He's cheap, 2,700. I think that's fine. And a Jiwon Bay, he's got some speed down at the bottom of the list. He'll probably be in the seven or eight hole at the very least. Um, but these guys are going to be able to throw in some lefties uh, against Cutter Crawford, and he's very much attackable. So uh, really like O'Neill Cruz here. He hits lefties at an incredible rate. Uh, excuse me, hits righties at an incredible rate from the left side. And he's got a crap load of power. Very, very good play here. He might steam later on in the day, but um, you know, we'll have to see how the shortstop pool plays out in general. But really good play here, and also playable price for Brian Reynolds, who got into Graham Ashcraft yesterday and hit a dinger in Cincinnati. So uh, some playable pieces here from the Pirates as well. I think we can target some offense in this uh, Pittsburgh and Boston game. All right, moving on, Toronto and KC. Uh, Toronto got bludgeoned yesterday because Chris Bassett was awful. Um, Maybe, maybe that could happen again today because Jose Barrios was awful last season. 9,100, this price is too high given his uh, his, his splits from last year, he got tattooed by lefties as well. 298 average, 373 Woba, and a 216 ISO allowed with a 17% strikeout rate. 2.0 homers per nine to the left side because he was on the barrel. He's actually got the uh, second highest barrel rate uh, on the on the day today, I believe, at a full 9.5%. This is really worrisome. So he gives up a lot of hard contact, and it's a lot of really solid contact to the left side still these numbers had plenty of time to normalize over the course of last season and they just didn't uh he was attackable for pretty much um every single outing so uh as we can see here at a 523 era perhaps a bit noisy because he gave up so much power um in the air maybe some some positive regression coming for him but only if he can figure out the breaking stuff Throwing the slider, he was floating it all last season, but it was really the problem um, that he couldn't locate and he couldn't spot the fastball. Uh, at just 94, everybody's going to, like, if you're just piping this four-seamer at 94 miles an hour, uh, you're going to get blasted. So um, sinker is still an okay pitch for him, but for the most part, uh, he's too expensive today, and even at 7.5%, like he'd have to be 2.5% ownership for me to consider this against the Royals. Uh, that said, the Royals, not all that great. They got torn apart again by um, Joe Ryan yesterday. So really off to a pretty cold start. Uh, not going to be... You know, sometimes this year, we're, we're going to be able to target this lineup. They'll figure it out, but um, they are struggling at the plate as of right now. 8,900 on the mound for the Royals is Brady Singer, and... This projection perhaps a, a tick low, it looks like. He's got a 24.5% strikeout rate. Good suppression numbers. 323 ERA with a 330 expected. Buck 14 whip because it don't walk people. So um, throwing strike one and not putting himself in, in bad spots and not putting people on base for free is going to keep him serviceable. At 8,900, I think this is okay in general. However, he gets Toronto, and they're a very sticky lineup. They struck out at just a 20% clip last season, created against right-handers at uh, 118 WRC plus with a 165 ISO, 333 Woba. So uh, really good split-adjusted numbers for the Blue Jays up here. And, of course, that's pretty much everybody in the top of the lineup. They've even added a lefty in Dalton Varsho to make it um, a little bit more difficult to get through. At 3,800, this is a decent spot for Varsho, excuse me, because he can get the ball in the air. And Brady Singer is a full 1.6 ground ball to fly ball guy. So uh, that's generally the sort of batted ball split that we want to target. Um, Fly ball hitters and line drive hitters against heavy ground ballers, and kind of the inverse. Um, So really nothing to speak of from the right side uh, in terms of attack ability. And unfortunately for Toronto, most of their lineup is hitting from the right side of the plate. Uh, They 
really do only have the one regular starter from the left side, and that's Dalton Varsho. So um, he would be the one piece I'd, I'd consider getting a, a decent amount of uh, because Singer does give up a little bit of power, 176 ISO to the left side. Now, Varsho is going to strike out in this matchup because Singer does have a, a you know a really, really high strikeout rate, 28.5% to the left side, but a worrisome hard contact rate. And a markedly lower ground ball to fly ball ratio against lefties than he does against righties. So really don't want the righties at all, um, unless it would be like a Danny Jansen. He would be the only like really heavy fly ball hitter that you could consider um, that won't strike out a whole hell of a lot in this particular matchup. Could be a, a decent batted ball profile matchup for him, but uh, mostly just a VAR show and maybe like a one-off Danny Jansen or something like that. Uh, Allie Kirk at 3,700. He is an okay playable piece as well. I mean, you could definitely play Vlad, Vladdy at 5,100. This is a good price for him, to be honest. Um, so you can play some of these guys. Uh, I wouldn't go crazy with it because I do kind of respect Singer. At 8,900, he could be something that we could consider on the mound as well, since we're kind of starving for a little bit of value. Atlanta and the Cardinals, as I alluded to yesterday, Schuster got blown up a little bit. Uh, it's because he couldn't throw any strikes. Charlie Morton, also a little bit susceptible to walking people. He's always had problems throwing strike one and getting ahead of hitters. It's just that his curveball has always been so good that he's got the swing and miss. But later in his career, as the velocity starts to drop off, um, the secondary stuff is going to be really the first to, to go. So he stays on the barrel, does does Morton, and that's pretty worrisome against a very potent lineup over here in the Cardinals. Saw what they did to uh, Chris Bassett yesterday. So um, hard hit rate, really worrisome as well for Charlie Morton, and we that we want to target lefties with him. 229 average, so not... You, anything terribly worrisome there, but a full 220 ISO and a lot of power given up here um, with some, you know, an 080 ground ball to fly ball ratio against lefty. So he's getting it in the air and that translates to a full 1.9 homers per nine to the left side of the plate. So that's how we want to attack. You want to stay away from righties in general uh, against Charlie Morton. 29% strikeout rate, buck 40 ground ball to fly ball ratio, and really not a lot of power, just a 138 ISO allowed. So uh, that's really how we want to attack with the Cardinals. And in the past, the Cardinals had been very right-handed heavy, and that's really not the case anymore this year. They've got Brendan Donovan up at the top of the list. They also have Nolan Gorman, who they're giving a really solid look this year uh, as well. They have Tommy Edmond down at the bottom who can flip it over. They also have Alec Burleson, who had a huge day yesterday, um, that they will put at the top of the lip list rather, along with uh, Lars Newtbar. So they've got some lefties now, and it's not just a Goldschmidt, Arenado, and uh, Wilson Contreras, with, who used to be Yadi Molina. Um, in the lineup that, you know, so they were very attackable in the past with right-handers, but not so much anymore. They've got a, some, some really sneaky pieces over here that are really seeing the baseball right now. So I like the Cardinals and their lefties, especially if, uh, Charlie's ownership steams a little bit. It doesn't right now, or it, it's not right now at, at you know, sub 10%. So this is fine, but the price tag is a bit too high at 9,600 for my taste against the Cardinals right now. I like uh, I like getting to, to the birds here a little bit. Jake Woodford on the other side, he's a bullpen arm. Um, came out of the bullpen pretty much exclusively last season, just got the one start. And his numbers were good, but perhaps in the XFIP department should see some, some regression. The issue with him is that he can't strike anybody out. He's only got an aggregate 13% strikeout rate, and he's pitching to a crap load of contact. This is the highest number of the day at 83.5%. And although he does stay off the barrel with a high ground ball to fly ball ratio, if you can't throw it by anybody, there's going to be good hitters that can't take advantage of that. And that's really how we always want to attack the Braves. It's with guys that have swing and miss because last season in aggregate against right-handers, they struck out at a 25% clip. Did hit for some power, of course, but um, notably just only slightly above average in the run creation. So uh, 
attackable with guys that have swing and miss stuff, and Jake Woodford definitely is not. So at 6,200, I don't think you can play him here. Um, even though we are starving for some value, as I mentioned, this projection here at about 7.5 points looks pretty accurate to me. How do we want to attack? Well, coming out of the bullpen, it, it once again, the, the numbers are a little bit skewed because the, the matchups for relief pitchers are mostly set up, and that's not going to be the case when you're in a starting rotation. So uh, you could play pretty much everybody from the, from the Braves again because that's their one weakness is swing and miss. Um, Acuna, Olsen, Riley, Albies here, all very strong plays. Michael Harris, Sean Murphy as well. Hopefully he can get off the schneid a little bit, uh, but you could play a lot of the Braves as well. I, I, I do like some sneaky, um, some sneaky offense in this game. Perhaps not sneaky from the Brave standpoint, but definitely from the Cardinals. I think you could play them for sure. Okay, Baltimore, Texas, trying to get through this uh, quickly here. Uh, Kyle Bradish on the mound, 6,900. No strikeout rate from Kyle Bradish either. Um, he's not going to be owned today, so this could be one of the few pieces that you could consider. But, man, I really don't like going after Texas. Um, this is a good team over here, and they got some damn good hitters uh, and some, some young hitters that are probably going to continue their early sort of debut success, if you will, like a Josh Young, notably. Um, really don't like going after them in general. So today, probably not going to be on my short list of, of targetable starters. Walk rate, slightly elevated for Bradish at about 9%. He's got the cutter-slider curveball mix. Cutter's not all that great, but the slider is pretty good. Curveball's okay as well. And those two pitches really bail him out of his you know, below average first pitch strike rate and the problems that um, that causes for him, which is why we see an elevated walk rate. So a little worrisome there. And if you could put guys on base against the Rangers, they can make you pay with a lot of really, really good hitters over here. 490 ERA, 401 expected um, in the XFIP, but pretty much mostly in line with where Bradish is going to be. Uh, unless he's retooled an arsenal um, that's not showing up in the numbers here. I, probably not the best spot to be targeting him today. Does give up a little bit of reverse split, split power. 280 average allowed to the righties. 350 Woba, pretty notable number there. 176 ISO and a 21.5% strikeout rate to the right side. 1.5 homers per nine. So you can target everybody. Of course, the guys on the left side of the split as well. Uh, Corey Seager you can play as can you play uh, Nate Lowe here. Uh, two really good prices for these guys, 46 for Seager, 42 for Lowe. Um, very playable. Robbie Grossman's going to be a little bit sticky, kind of hitting in the middle of the list here at 2,600. Very playable price, and certainly some low ownership initially on all of the Texas bats. So I think you can stack some Texas here and, and get after Kyle Bradish. I like this a good bit. On the other side, John Gray mentioned him a little bit in the opening. 9200 decent price for John. And I think the projection is probably right in line with um, with where he should be. If he can, historically, John Gray's problem has really been uh, power to lefties. But last year, he neutralized that a lot and really started you know, burying the slider. As he got out of Coors Field, it allowed him to, to really bite down on the spin. And, and start burying the pitch back foot to lefties, which is really uh, when he came up with the Rockies, what made him so valuable was a wipeout slider. So um, still just three pitches for John and not using a changeup a whole hell of a lot, but when he does use it, it's very, very good value for him. So that is helping to suppress a lot of the lefty power anymore. And pretty average numbers all, all across the board. 150 ISO to both sides, give or take. High strikeout rate to the right side. So you want to probably avoid any of the righties, like a Ryan Mountcastle, for example, uh, from Baltimore. But you can certainly consider still getting to some of the lefties. If John Gray's not uh, fully stretched out, I mean, there's some variance with John. And he, when he's bad and, and not burying the slider, he could be really, really bad. He could start walking people, putting people on base, and then he'll give up a dinger, and it's all of a sudden 4 nothing or whatever. So um, it's, it's reasonable to consider playing both sides of this game. You can play Baltimore. Um, offensively, they look fantastic at the early part of the season. Cedric, 54, got a price drop. I like this. 
Adley uh, behind the plate, 5,100. This is playable as well. A little stiff to get to a catcher at 51 on a full slate, but Santander at 48. I think this is perfectly playable. 41 for Gunner. I really like this price. Um, I think this is a good spot for Gunner, and he could be a very interesting one-off. Probably don't want to get to too much in the bottom half of the list, like a Terran Vavra. Kyle Stowers, though, does have a crap load of power. And in, at 2,100, if you do stack the, the upper uh, part of the lineup for the Orioles, don't forget about Kyle Stowers down here at 2,100. Cheap, and uh, he's got a lot of power. So um, attackable with both sides here. I think John Gray is one of the... up one of the few upper tier pitchers that uh, we could be a little bit more confident in uh, going after, even though I really don't generally like attacking the Orioles. Detroit and Houston, uh, Matt Boyd on the mound um, coming back, I guess last year was his uh, sort of resurgence and, and return against Tommy John, really a tiny sample, just 13 innings last year. Um, didn't even start a game. He came out of the bullpen. So he's going to be back into the rotation and back with the Tigers. Um, Really, the problem with Matt Boyd historically, we're not going to see that in the numbers here, has been walks, and it's been hard contact to the right side of the plate. He does have some swinging strike stuff and some whiff stuff, and that's because he's got, you know, relative, he's always had a pretty decent slider, but it's hard contact to righties that has really plagued him in the past, and it's homers. So at 7,200, probably going to stay off today, certainly against the Astros. Um, we are really... I mean, almost never going to be playing a lefty against the Astros. They're so right-handed heavy, and they're very, very strong. Uh, Jeremy Pena, Alex Bregman, neither of these guys strike out. I mean, Pena strikes out, but um, he's leading off, and he's a freaking pest at the top of the lineup, got a lot of power. Bregman doesn't strike out and is a pretty damn good hitter himself. Josie Abreu, also very sticky to get through. David Hensley, Chaz has had a, a decent start to the season. Corey Jolks, big prospect for them. Um also getting regular playing time. Not a list that I, I want to target. Of course, you'll you'll have Jordan Alvarez back in the in the lineup today. So uh, and he hits lefties just fine. Uh, so not playing Matt Boyd at 7,200. Even though th this will be an intriguing price tag for him because he does have whiff stuff. Um, but Houston, not the matchup. Hunter Brown on the other side. Um, Top prospect for the the Astros as well. Uh, really, really good stuff. Uh, he's got gas in the tank. He can top it 98, 99, and he's got an excellent curveball as well At a down here at 83, 84. Throws it a lot and mixes in a slider too. So it doesn't really have a, an off-speed pitch with a change that would really help him sort of wipe out lefties, but that will come as he develops it more. So... This can certainly be a target for us today uh, against the Tigers since the Tigers are terrible. Of course, we saw what Jeff Springs did to, to them yesterday. 34% uh, ownership on Hunter Brown, though. Um, it, you know, we're starting to get into worrisome territory. Uh, I think the projection may be perhaps a tick low, however. So in that regard, um, maybe the ownership's not too low. But uh, good numbers really across the board for him. Um so far in, in just the, the short 20 inning sample that he exhibited last season, really nothing to speak of in terms of susceptibility. So uh, I don't want, I don't want any of the tigers um, pretty much anybody almost ever uh, Austin Meadows, 3,500. You could play him. He's still got pop and torque. We really don't want to play him against anybody that has strikeout stuff. So ride the greens. Okay. He's probably a bit overpriced at 4,000 given the raw upside that we're targeting at, in general at that price range. But, um, you know, as, as we can see here, the Sheets value scores, uh, you know, mid-teens on most of, most of them, uh, really not something super attackable. But I like um, I like full correlation stacks of the Astros here. You can get to them for sure. Uh, let's check the betting markets. Where are they? Yeah, you're laying a big number, uh, $2.30 here um, with the Strohs against the Tigers. It's probably warranted. You could throw these guys in, into some parlays if you want today. Okay, uh, she's frozen. There we go. Um, Angels and Seattle. We're going to see a little bit of chalk here on the mound down here with George Kirby. We'll get hit, get to him in a second. Reed Detmers uh, threw a no-hitter last year somehow. I have really no idea how. Um, doesn't have a hell of a lot of swing and miss. Um, just a 22.5% strikeout rate. Fine suppression numbers, just a kind of middle to back end of the rotation type of starter. Um, slightly elevated walk rate, 8.5%. But throw strike one at a 60% cliff, that's kind of the 
the threshold we look for. Lower CSW and not worrisome, but called strike department at sub 16% is really what's dragging this down because the swinging strikes are at a, a, over 11%, which is fine. Um, stays off the barrel. 8% is, is nothing terrible. It's about league average. But um, today on this slate is, is slightly elevated relative to a lot of the other guys. How do we want to attack Reed? Well, it's generally just with righties. Um, he's a typical fly ball pitcher with the four-seamer slider mix. Does have a, a curveball that he mixes in as well. Um, marginal changeup, it, it's not very good, but hasn't really translated into raw power. That's because he's a fly ball pitcher uh, from, or, you know, to both sides of the plate. But uh, against lefties, he's actually a slight ground ball lean. So um, really all of the fly balls are coming to same-handed hitters from the right side, and that's that puts us into to Julio, Ty France, Gino Suarez territory, Tay Oscar as well. They've got a lot of power here from the right side. Cal Raleigh hits from the right side also. So you can definitely get to uh, some good Seattle stacks if you want to target a guy that's got a, a slightly elevated contact rate, 77%, and it's not going to really throw it by them over here in Seattle. Um, they're going to be sticky, and as soon as Seattle really gets rolling here, they're going to be fun to play for sure uh, this season. I think Reed is probably a bit overpriced at 8200 here. 13% ownership, I definitely don't want to eat on him in this particular matchup. Prefer the Mariners uh, if that persists. On the other side, George Kirby. We like, we like Kirby a lot. 25% K rate, good suppression metrics, 339, 333 expected. Buck 21 whip and a 4% walk rate. He's got impeccable control, and he throws strike one. Gets ahead of hitters. He does throw the four-seamer a lot at a full 50% clip, but with subpar breaking stuff in the slider and the curveball, because he throws so many strike one, or so much strike one, I should say, that allows him to get away with some some really uh, marginal and below average, well below average in case of the slider, uh, secondary pitches. So if we're targeting Kirby, um, he's about a neutral ground ball to fly ball here. He, he will stay on the barrel a little bit, slightly elevated at eight eight and a half percent. It's going to be with righties, and really the left side of the play has got a full 27 percent strikeout rate. So it's a bit of a reverse split here for Kirby, just because the slider is not very good and he floats a little bit. So um, if you want to play some right-handers, 324 average allowed. That's a huge number. Buck 68 ISO, not terribly huge, but worrisome for sure, and a 22 percent strikeout rate. Hard contact rate is really what we're after, and 35% is a big number, and it's elevated for Kirby. So at 25.5% ownership, that those are some worrying stats. And when we're talking about righties from the Angels, that's Mike Trout, that's Hunter Renfro territory, and uh, that is Anthony Rendon as well. Of course, we're going to have um, Choi Otani in the list as well. So uh, Taylor Ward, really good hitter back at the at the top of the lineup. So this is going to be sticky and difficult to navigate. Luis Renjifo hits from both sides. So I think you can get to some Angels stacks here uh, if you want to play some curvy because the Angels will still s exhibit a little bit of strikeout stuff. Um, it's going to be markedly lower than the 27% that they displayed last season. So you can play both sides here. I probably won't get to a full 25% curvy, um, but I think a, a decent 15% is probably warranted at 8000 8, he's underpriced for his raw upside, so that plays in his favor. Um, I think the average aggregate projection here, or the median projection, I, sh I should say, is probably a tick high, um, but overall, you know, right in range with probably where he should be. But I think you can play both the Angels uh, and the Mariners here. No Reed Detmers for me, and probably just a little bit of Kirby. Okay, Cleveland and Oakland. Um... Zach Plezak on the mound can't play Plezak. Only an 18 and a half or 17 and a half percent strikeout rate. Uh, really, not suppressing all that much. You know, mid four ZRA, buck 32 WHIP. Not because he's walking people, but it's because he can't strike anybody out and he throws so much contact. Full 80 percent contact rate. Um, four pitches here, which is you know makes him serviceable and keeps him in a rotation. If he only had three pitches, uh, at, at with these numbers, he would be a bullpen arm. So or kind of a long relief arm. Uh, how we really want to attack Plezak most often, uh, you can get to him with both sides, really. Uh, 288 average, 360 Woba, 181 ISO against lefties, however, and a markedly lower strikeout rate at 15%. Hard contact to both sides, 31%. 
30% respectively to lefties and righties. Um, anything over 30 here is a bit worrisome, and he's a major fly ball pitcher to left-handers. So that's where we'd prefer to get to him. And from Oakland, unfortunately, that's you know we don't really have anybody. Uh, that's kind of only Seth Brown territory. Um, you don't really have any other lefties that you're super excited about. Perhaps you could play a Tony Kemp leading off. He'll lead off at 3,300. That's a pretty good price tag for him. But um, really just kind of a, a, a value play there. If you want to do like a a two-man get really off the board with a Seth Brown, Tony Kemp, um, maybe play Shea behind the plate or something like that. I think that's reasonable. Jesus Aguilar doesn't strike out. Uh, he's got plenty of pop, and it will hit righties just fine. He might not even play today, though. Um, so really hard to get to Oakland. They don't have a lot of versatility uh, for the most part which would otherwise make Zach Plezak kind of playable, which is why you're seeing an elevated ownership on him at 18% right now. 7900 the price tag's too high. You could you could consider him in cash, but uh, in tournaments, I just don't, the upside is just not there. James Caprillion on the other side, similar to him, there should be a lot of, con- or similar to Plezak rather, there should be a lot of contact uh, in this game. He has an 80% contact rate as well, and just a 17% strikeout rate too. So, Cap actually walks a bit more people, a few more people than um, Zach Plezak up here. So if we're targeting full stacks, I'd rather just get to the Guardians. They're a much better lineup, and uh, the prices are, are virtually the same. The ownership on them right now is minimal. So I would really enjoy getting to some of the Guardians, Stephen Kwan, uh, Josie Ramirez in particular. Um, you can play some Josh Bell. He's at 4400 probably elevated price tag for him, but uh, no Nothing to be terribly worried about, but Andre Jimenez down at the bottom of the list, 4,000, a uh, very workable left-handed bat as well. That's how we like to, to get after cap um, is certainly, I mean, we could do it with both sides of the plate, really. Buck 58 ISO to lefties and, you know, a flat, of one, flat 1.0 homers per nine to the left side. Slightly elevated barrel at 8%. It's not terrible, but uh, once again, it is elevated uh, relative to everybody else on the slate today. Exhibits a bit of a reverse split in terms of the raw power allowed as well. 195 ISO to right side, but the strikeout rate to both sides, um, really nothing to write home about. So uh, power numbers, Caprillion generally suppresses power pretty well because he throws a lot of his games at a huge ballpark over in Oakland. Um, But you know, this game here, there, there should be a lot of contact. And 8,400, I think both of these guys, 84 for Cap and 7,900 for Please, I think they're both overpriced. Um, and I think you can consider getting to some offense here, like the Guardians, a, a pretty good bit. All right, Arizona and San Diego. Ryan Nelson on the mound. Uh, just got a couple of starts for them last season, getting the Padres. Uh, going to be really tough to target the Padres this season. Um, not super interested in going after them in general, uh, especially as they start to heat up. Um, if Juan Soto can really start displaying any of the numbers that he showed in, in Washington, in San Diego, then this this lineup is going to be absolutely deadly. So um, really generally not super excited about targeting um, pretty much anybody uh, unless they've got well north of a 25% strikeout rate against both sides of the plate, and Ryan Nelson really doesn't have that yet. Problem with Nelson is, excuse me, and at least in his, his few appearances last year, he couldn't throw strike one, and if he's going to put people on base for free against a lineup of uh, Xander Bogarts, Machado, Soto, Jake Cronenworth, ha Kim makes a lot of contact, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for him to navigate. So no Ryan Nelson for me at 7,700. I think he's overpriced here. He probably need to be 6,700 to start to consider it and take shots. But, um, you know, in tournaments at very low ownership, you could get to him because nobody's going to target him against Padres. But uh, really not my, my favorite play by any means whatsoever. Would prefer just playing the Padres and, and seeing if they can um, – if they can get to a young arm here on the other side, Ryan Weathers, um, he's got okay stuff. Like it, it not a lot of versatility. Uh, we don't have a, any large sample here, but he, he's only got three pitches really relies on just the three. Um, but he's a, a ground baller and he has typically, uh, just been a bullpen type of guy. So not a lot of numbers here in the sheet here, but, uh, at 6,000, 
um, against Arizona, targeting some lefties in general. Uh, if he's stretched out enough, and, and this isn't just going to be a bullpen arm for the Padres, which it may be, uh, I think you could probably consider going after the Diamondbacks here. Um, who I would consider playing on the other side would be a Christian Walker. Uh, I like Corbin Carroll at 2,900 still. He's got enough speed to sort of negate the uh, handedness deficit that he's going to see lefty-lefty. Um, but Ryan Weathers may very well just be an innings eater here. If the Padres out of the gate, they play, they play like 26 games in 27 days or something um, in the first month of the season. So they're going with a six-man rotation. And that's why we haven't seen you Darvish yet. Uh, he's not fully stretched out given that he, he pitched in the, in the Classic for Japan. Um, so they're adding just another uh, sort of filler piece here, and that's really the, the role that Weathers is serving right now. So um, really no pitching to speak of for me here. Um, you could consider taking punts on some Weathers if you'd like. Uh, would prefer the Padres and maybe a one-off piece. Could tell Marte hits from both sides. You could play him. He's fine. Uh, and Corbin Carroll. Lourdes, maybe. They're, they're cheap enough to play as a as a uh, an interesting little three-man stack here, but I wouldn't get any more crazy than that. All right, last game of the day here, uh, Colorado um, in their first series against the Dodgers. Uh, okay, Ryan Feltner on the mound. I love this kid, man, um, but he just, does, he just doesn't have the stuff quite yet. Uh, he's got problems throwing strike one. He stays on the barrel, and he's a neutral ground ball to fly ball pitcher that doesn't have enough whiff stuff. Uh, the command is really plaguing him early in his, early in his career, and even at 6,400, like, there's upside for him at this particular price tag, but not in this particular matchup against Dodgers. This is still the Dodgers. They still have Mookie. They still have Freddie. They still have Will Smith. They got JD, who hits um, hits right. He's perfectly fine still this late in his career. Trace Thompson hit three dingers the other day. Like, my goodness. Um, but this is still the Dodgers, and their lineup is going to be terribly difficult to navigate uh, really all season. And Feltner on the barrel at an 8% clip, fly balls, and a lot of hard contact. Um, we, you just can't go after him. There's going to be times where you'll play Ryan Feltner as he grows and, and figures out the arsenal a bit, uh, coming, you know, growing into his, uh, his role as a staple in their rotation for the Rockies. But uh, this is not definitely not the spot for him. You can play the Dodgers. They're going to be popular. Their price tags, however, 61 for Mookie, 57 for Freddie, and 5K for Will Smith. JD, um, you can play some Max Muncy for sure. He's he's playable, 4600, I believe. Don't have him in the uh, in the sheet here, but um, I think that's a playable price. These guys are going to push 10, 15 percent ownership uh, pretty much every day uh, against a, a weak rocky starter. So keep that in mind when you uh, when you click in some of the Dodgers. Maybe some short stacks of the Dodgers are playable uh, if you do want to get to some more expensive arms on the mound. Michael Grove on the other side. Um, really worrisome here for Michael. It, it, he just doesn't have the, the strikeout stuff. Short sample from last year, but they did give him a look on the mound as a starter. Um, he's probably only going to... He's going to get Dave Roberts 75 pitches or something. Uh, that's probably as deep as he's going to go. 5,600, though, against Rockies, they're going to strike out a lot, right? So this is reasonable to consider. The problem is he just doesn't have any swing and miss stuff. He's going to be a fly ball pitcher with the four-seamer slider mix, if, as we've alluded to. And with a bad slider, that, that makes it really kind of worrisome and, and difficult to get to. So uh, we'll see if he's reworked anything in the off season. 5,600, the, the price is fine. Ownership, probably a little elevated, but I think the projection is about accurate. Uh, for this particular matchup. That said, with somebody that's not going to throw it by the Rockies and strike them out, that's their main weakness. And you may very well, we, we did see Jerry Profar get a start yesterday. Um, so he's finally with the team, and and he'll be starting again and leading off for the Rockies. Uh, Chris Bryant's actually been healthy. He's looked excellent at the plate to start the season. Um, you know, Rockies, as of right now, they're not below 500 yet, so that's a, that's a plus for them. Um, Ryan McMahon kind of struggling a little bit out of the gate, but they still have some playable pieces over here. Charlie Blackman, 4,400, well-priced. C.J. Crone, 5,200, probably not well-priced, but um, as much power as anybody here. So you can get to a really, really off-the-board in deep tournaments 
um, rocky stack if you'd like against Michael Grove. Once again, only an 18% K rate and not going to blow it by anybody. Will will yield some fly balls, so that's that's definitely uh, attackable uh, with some of the the line drive hitters like a Charlie Blackman, Chris Bryant over here for Colorado. Uh, okay, so that's it for the breakdown. Um, quickly, we'll just go over stacks. Um, don't really want to stack against uh, against Nestor or Taiwan Walker here. Um, maybe a piece or two for the Yankees. Not super crazy about it. Uh, do like some Tampa lefties for sure against Trevor Williams. Um, I like Drew Rasmussen on the mound also. Uh, Pittsburgh and Boston. I think we can get to some offense here. Definitely some lefties and some stacks for Pittsburgh. Uh, you can play Boston on the other side as well, like a Verdugo and definitely a... Um, uh, I'm blanking somehow. Uh, Rafi Devers, my goodness. Um, you played Turner and Masataka Yoshida as well. Uh, Toronto and Kansas City. Um, I like some Kansas City. Uh, they're gonna be, they're gonna be frustrating to play this year because they're not very good. But Jose Barros got tattooed by lefties last season. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to attack that until he tells me that I shouldn't. Um, you know, you can get to some KC bats here. Michael Massey, Vinny Pascantino. Uh, in particular, you could play some. Um, MJ Melendez as well. Very workable stack over here for Kansas City. And against Brady Singer, um, really only the major weakness for him is is lefties. So Dalton Varsho is a fine play. Don't really want to stack Toronto necessarily, but um, you know would prefer KC side for the most part here. Um, Brady Singer, 8,900. Eh, he's all right. I think he was 8,900. Yeah. Um, on the mound, not my favorite. Charlie Morton, also not my favorite on the mound, uh, would prefer getting to both um, Atlanta and St. Louis stacks here. Uh, St. Louis, you can really target um, Charlie Morton's lefty problems uh, for the Cardinals. Uh, Baltimore and Texas, um, like Texas here uh, a decent bit. You can play John Gray also. Uh, you can certainly play Baltimore. They're seeing the baseball. It's a good baseball team over here. So um, they, they're playable, and John Gray has some variants with them. No Detroit for me. Uh, or Matthew Boyd, like Houston, pretty much full correlations, including Hunter Brown. Angels, uh, no Reed Detmers, but you could play Angel Stacks. Seattle, you could play both George Kirby, probably a bit under the field for me, but you could play Seattle Stacks also. Cleveland, I like uh, against James Caprillion, and really no Oakland, maybe a one off piece or there against Zach Plesak. Uh Ryan Nelson, no for me, and maybe a, a one off you know, short stack pieces for Arizona, uh, like San Diego, <clears throat> excuse me, San Diego on the other side, probably no Ryan Weathers would like to just get, sort of feel that out. Fine price tag for him down here, and Arizona's not going to be all that great. Um, maybe some off-the-board Colorado stacks against Michael Grove, but no Ryan Feltner for sure, and definitely some Dodgers. So that's where we are for the breakdown, guys. Not going to go over uh, the other sort of short slates, the early slate and the, and the turbo slate. Um but hopefully, as I mentioned at the outset, hopefully we'll have those uh, projections up um, as we move a little bit deeper into the season. Uh, but that's it for now. Keep an eye out for the projections and uh, hit us up in Discord. Uh, we'll be there all day. Good luck.